Hello friends, I'm Sanjay. In this series, I'm covering the business study subject from the CBSE class 12 syllabus. We will be following the standard NCERT textbook for the topics that we will discuss. This is the seventh video of the series and uh, we will cover the seventh chapter, Directing. In the first part of this series, we discussed about the various functions of management. Planning is the first function where you decide at a high level what is to be done, how it is to be done and when it is to be done. You will set the goals and decide the strategy for the organization to achieve those goals. To implement that plan or implement that strategy, you will have to organize the resources that are required. So organizing includes allocating resources like time, money and people and deciding team structures and assigning duties to the different roles or positions in your teams. Based on the roles and the team structures that you have finalized in the organizing stage, you will create job descriptions and you will hire or recruit the people in the next step, which is staffing. After the staffing stage, you now have the plan, you have the resources and you have the people. So now it is time to execute. The next step is directing, where you direct, give instructions and lead the teams to make use of the resources and to work as per the plans to achieve the objectives of the organization. In the directing stage, you ensure that the various tasks or activities assigned to the people in the organization are being completed by them. What is the meaning of directing? Suppose you are a king in an ancient kingdom and you decided to build a temple. The first step is planning what kind of temple will you build, where, etc. The next step is organizing where you organize the money that is required, you procure the land and you identify the source of the stones that you will use for the temple. You also decide how many people are required to work on your temple and how the work teams will be structured. In the staffing stage, you will hire the people. You will hire the sculptors, the architects and the workmen required for your project. In the directing stage, you will start giving instructions and guiding the people whom you have hired to start the work and to complete the activities or the tasks which have been assigned to them. The process of directing can be observed in everyday situations like uh, when a manager is managing some employees or a teacher is teaching some students or a director is directing some actors in some movie shootings. So the primary goal of directing is to achieve the predetermined objectives by working as per the plans which have been decided in the planning stage. Directing is a very broad concept. It includes instructing, guiding and counseling people to achieve organizational goals. A very important point here is that directing includes motivation and leadership and not just supervision and communication. Because just giving instructions or directions will not get you the results in all cases. Managers have to keep the employees motivated and lead them on a day to day basis. So directing is a key or an important managerial function that is essential throughout the life of an organization. Now what are the main characteristics of directing? Directing initiates action because you have the plans, you have the resources and you have the people, but there is no action. The action starts when the managers start directing the staff. Just like in a movie shooting, the acting actually starts when the director says lights, camera, action. Directing occurs in every management level because all managers from the topmost executives to the supervisors engage in directing as a part of their day to day activities. Directing is a continuous process because it persists and continues throughout the life of the organization, regardless of the managerial changes. Directing stops only when the organization becomes defunct or dead. Directing flows from the top to bottom. It starts from the top level and cascades down through the organizational hierarchy because the top level management or the topmost executive will give strategic directions to their subordinates, who will give operational directions to their subordinates and even the shop floor or the factory floor supervisors will give task or activity level directions to the workers. So directions flow from the top 
which is the topmost parts of the management to the bottom that is the lowest level workers in the organization what is the importance of directing the textbook mentions six points regarding the importance of directing directing initiates action within an organization by guiding employees towards achieving the desired objectives for example supervisors help subordinates in understanding the tasks which have been assigned to them and also how to achieve their work targets it uh, integrates efforts so directing ensures that uh, the individual efforts of all the employees align with the organizational goals and thereby promoting teamwork and organizational performance a leader can effectively convince the employees that both individual efforts and team efforts contribute to achieving the goals of the organization directing realizes potential directing can help employees in realizing their potential through motivation and effective leadership good leaders identify employee potential and motivate them to perform to their full capabilities directing facilitates change because directing helps in managing changes within the organization by reducing the resistance through motivation communication and leadership for example when a new process or a new system is introduced in a factory the workers may be resistant to the change because it requires them to learn new things and it can change the way that they have been previously working and uh, people are normally resistant to change managers can ease the transition to the new systems or the new process by explaining training and motivating the employees as to why these new systems or new processes are beneficial to the employees and the company this uh, explaining training and motivating is also part of the directing function directing brings stability and balance because effective directing fosters cooperation and commitment among the employees ensuring stability and balance within the organization by harmonizing various groups various activities and the various departments what are the principles of directing these eight points are some of the fundamental aspects that the manager should be aware of and should follow in the process of directing maximum individual contribution which means that the directing techniques should help every individual in the organization in contributing to their maximum potential thereby enhancing overall organizational efficiency for example effective motivation plans with the appropriate rewards can encourage employees to give their best harmony of objectives which means that directing should align individual employee objectives with organizational goals thereby ensuring that both work together for instance by demonstrating that employee rewards are linked to the performance of the organization conflicts between personal and organizational goals can be minimized unity of command which simply means that every person should have only one boss employees should receive instructions from only one superior to avoid any confusion and conflict this will ensure clear and effective direction appropriateness of direction techniques the directing approach or the specific techniques that are used should be tailored to the needs the capabilities and the attitudes of the subordinates because people are different and managers should adapt their approach or their techniques based on what will work for that specific employee or the specific group of employees for example some employees may be motivated by money whereas others might be motivated by promotions managerial communication which says that effective communication is essential for clear instructions and understanding managers should ensure that subordinates fully comprehend or understand their directives and provide feedback to clarify on any misunderstandings which means that communication should be both ways managers should talk and also listen use of informal organization every organization has both formal teams and also informal groups for example there may be different teams in a software company but uh, there may also be an informal group of persons from different teams who are all interested in working on artificial intelligence projects managers should recognize and leverage these informal groups within the organization to enhance the directing process 
leadership which says that managers should exercise strong leadership to positively influence their subordinates ensuring that direction is both effective and satisfactory if managers are not strong leaders then someone else will become the leader which may not be in the best interest of the organization and finally follow through which means that just giving instructions or directions is not enough managers must continuously monitor the implementation of their orders making necessary adjustments and making the necessary changes to ensure that the directives or the instructions are carried out effectively and any issues are addressed promptly what are the elements of direction or the elements of directing direction has four elements in it supervision motivation leadership and communication in this part we will discuss each of these elements in detail so here i will just give you brief examples for each of these four elements what is supervision suppose in a manufacturing plant a supervisor regularly checks on the progress of the assembly line workers he ensures that they are following all the safety protocols and meeting the production targets the supervisor also provides any guidance whenever any issues arise and also offers feedback on the performance of the workers this work of the supervisor or the activities of the supervisor is an example of supervision what is motivation a sales manager implements a monthly bonus system to motivate the sales team if the team surpasses or exceeds their sales target they will receive a financial bonus this reward encourages them to work hard and to improve their performance this reward system is an example of motivation what is leadership suppose a software company gets a very difficult assignment or a very difficult project to work on and the team members are very confused on how to start what to do etc then a project manager leads the team through this challenging project by setting a clear vision by making strategic decisions whenever required and by inspiring the team with enthusiasm the manager also helps the team stay focused and to achieve the project milestones this is an example of leadership and uh, what is communication suppose a ceo of a company holds a town hall meeting with all employees to discuss the organization's new strategic direction and some plans for the next year etc the ceo clearly explains the reasons behind any changes and answers questions from the employees ensuring that everyone is on the same page this is nothing but communication next we will look at each of these four elements in detail supervision is the first element of directing a supervisor guides the efforts and the resources of the organization to achieve the objectives of the organization he or she will oversee or supervise all the tasks and activities that are assigned to the employees and the supervisor will also ensure the optimal utilization of all resources now supervision is a function in hierarchy which means that supervision is typically performed by the persons positioned directly above the workers in the organization's hierarchy the supervisors bridge the gap between the management and the workforce but here you also need to remember that this title supervisor is given to those employees whose main job is to supervise workers but they are not the only supervisors in the organization every manager who is managing people is also a supervisor to some extent even the ceo is engaged in supervision when he or she is guiding the efforts of the top management what is the importance of supervision supervision is important in the day to day interactions of the organization because through supervision the manager or the supervisor maintains regular contact and friendly relations with the workers and acts as their guide or mentor as a communication link because supervision serves as a bridge between the workers and the management supervision conveys the ideas both ways in the sense through supervision ideas can be conveyed from the management to the workers and also from the workers to the management and through supervision any problems can be addressed immediately and any misunderstandings can also be prevented supervision is also important for group unity because it maintains harmony among the workers by resolving any internal conflicts and it fosters unity 
without a supervisor to manage the workers the teams may quickly become dysfunctional supervision is important for performance management because it ensures the tasks are completed according to the set targets and the supervisor or the manager takes responsibility for achieving goals and motivating the workers supervision is important for training because through his work a supervisor provides effective on the job training to all new employees and also enhances team efficiency through skill and knowledge development leadership influence which means that a supervisor with uh, strong leadership qualities can inspire high morale among the workers and uh, supervision is also important for feedback and skill development because supervisors can analyze the performance of the workers and offer constructive feedback on how to improve their work and how they can develop their work skills so these are the points regarding why supervision is important in an organization motivation is the second element of direction the concept of motivation is quite simple anything that makes you move is your motivation for example on a cold morning you are sleeping comfortably under a warm blanket you normally would not want to get out of the bed but you start feeling hungry so you get up to go and eat some breakfast the hunger is your motivation to move or it is raining outside and you are comfortable at home you normally would not want to go out anywhere but you have to go to your office so you get ready and go out so the need to go to office the need to earn money is your motivation or on a weekend you might just want to stay at home and watch something on netflix but you also need to go and meet your friend so the pleasure of meeting your friend is your motivation to go out there are uh, several definitions of this term motivation the textbook mentions four definitions william g scott said that motivation means a process of stimulating people to action to accomplish desired goals macfarlane said that motivation refers uh, to the way in which urges drives desires aspirations strivings or needs direct control and explain the behavior of human beings robert dubin said that motivation is a complex force starting with keeping a person at work in an organization motivation is something which moves the person to action and continues him in the course of action already initiated this definition is important and also interesting because he says that motivation is not just required at the time of starting an activity but also required for continuing with that activity till that ends which means that motivation has to continue as long as the task or the activity continues fred luthans said that motivation is a process which begins with a physiological or psychological need or deficiency which triggers behavior or a drive that is aimed at a goal or incentive this concept of a physiological or a psychological need as a cause for motivation is what i have previously explained hunger is a physiological need the need to go and meet your friends and socialize is a psychological need let us now talk about uh, the process of motivation and about motivation at the workplace the process of motivation follows a series of specific steps when your body needs food needs energy it is a physiological need the need for food or the need for energy is the unsatisfied need that unsatisfied need causes a tension in the body which is the feeling of hunger that feeling of hunger is the drive that makes a person to get up from bed in the morning then the person will start looking for some means to satisfy the need in this case the means to satisfy the hunger a source of food this is the search behavior and uh, once the person finds the food and uh, satisfies his or her hunger then the tension of hunger is reduced in this way there can be various unsatisfied physiological and psychological needs that a person may experience at various times these needs are the reasons for the motivations that drive a person if we did not have any needs then we would not be motivated to even get up from bed in the morning what is the role of motivation in an organization psychologists suggest that motivation is the key to getting people to work voluntarily you can force people to come to work by threatening them in some way 
but they will not be coming voluntarily and if they are not coming voluntarily even though they come to work there is no guarantee that they will actually do the work that they are supposed to be doing however if employees are motivated they come voluntarily and they will perform better at their work motivation involves stimulating people to act in a desired manner to achieve organizational goals which simply means that by motivating people their actions can be guided or even controlled to a certain extent so that their work is towards achieving the organizational goals coming to motivation at the workplace formal authority alone cannot guarantee best performance from employees you can see this in your school or in your college also just because a teacher has the formal authority to ask you to do something doesn't mean that you will always follow the teacher's instructions similarly in an organization just because the manager has the formal authority to order an employee to work on something doesn't guarantee that the employee will actually do the work however if the employee is motivated then he or she will do the work as required which means that understanding what drives people's behavior is crucial for managers because that drive can be the way to motivate people if an employee is purely driven by money then the motivation can be a bonus or some other financial reward per- for performance as you will see in almost all organizations some employees may be reluctant to work despite having the ability this may be due to lack of motivation so employees may just do the bare minimum to meet the minimum requirements and try not to do anything extra because they don't have any motivation so understanding what motivates individual employees is very important so managers need insights into the causes of employee behavior to motivate them and to improve their performance because motivations can be personal and different employees may have different motivation factors what are some of the key concepts or features of motivation you need to remember all of these concepts and features because they may be used for objective questions and these points can also be used in your subjective or essay type answers a motive is an internal state that drives behavior towards goals and these motives arise from needs such as uh, hunger thirst security etc motivation is the process of stimulating people to achieve desired goals by satisfying their needs and motivators are techniques used to influence employees and these motivators can be pay promotion recognition responsibility etc what are the important features of motivation motivation is an internal feeling because motivation stems from internal desires or internal needs such as the desire for comfort reputation possessions etc motivation causes goal directed behavior because motivation leads to behavior aimed at achieving specific goals like improving job performance for a promotion or for earning a bonus motivations can be positive or negative motivation can be driven by positive rewards such as a pay increase or a bonus or through negative consequences such as punishment motivation is a complex process motivation is complex because individuals have different expectations perceptions reactions etc so it is difficult to apply the same factors of motivation or the same motivators across multiple people which simply means that everyone will not be motivated by the same motivators what is the importance and what are the benefits of motivation in organizations these are fairly simple points understanding motivation helps in recognizing and fulfilling the needs of employees leading to improved performance which is the reason why major organizations invest heavily in motivational programs due to the significant benefits that such programs provide motivation improves performance proper motivation leads to satisfied employees who channel their energies towards optimal performance that is their performance will be better and this will benefit both the employees and the organization motivation changes attitudes now motivation can transform negative or indifferent attitudes into positive ones leading to better alignment with the organizational goals motivation reduces employee turnover 
by addressing motivational needs. Organizations can retain employees and thereby they can reduce the costs associated with recruitment and training. Motivation reduces absenteeism. Now, motivated employees are more likely to attend work regularly as good motivation addresses the common causes for absenteeism like poor working conditions or lack of recognition. And motivation facilitates change. Motivation helps managers introduce changes smoothly as employees are more likely to accept changes when they are associated with additional rewards. For example, if a company wants employees to do some additional work, just ordering the workers to do the work may lead to resentment and anger. But what if the company offers some additional pay or reward for the newly added work, at least for the first few weeks? Employees are more likely to take up this additional work or the additional process due to the extra pay and rewards. And they will eventually get used to the work. So in this way, the changes have been introduced smoothly. The next topic is Maslow's Need Hierarchy Theory of Motivation. This is one of the most important and probably the simplest theory that explains the concept of motivation. This theory simply says that people are motivated by various needs and these various types of needs can be organized in a hierarchy. If the basic needs or the lower level needs are not met, then people will not be interested in the higher level or the next level needs. And once the lower level needs are satisfied, they will not motivate people any longer. And that is when people will start looking at the next level needs. For example, the basic physiological needs like hunger, thirst, shelter, sleep are the basic motivators. If a person is extremely hungry or very thirsty or very sleepy, then he or she cannot think of anything else. The person will do whatever is required to satisfy these basic physiological needs. Once the basic needs are satisfied, then the person will be motivated by the next level needs, which are safety and security. So the person will work towards ensuring his or her physical and emotional security. Once uh, the needs at these two levels are met, then the person will start looking at the next level. The person will want affiliation and belongingness. Here the person will be motivated by the need for a family for being a part of a community, for friendship and acceptance by others. Once uh, the person has a family, friends, community, then the person will want self-respect, will want recognition by the society and attention from others and also a sense of status in the society. Typically, most people may reach up to this stage and stop because their esteem needs are never fulfilled. But uh, look at some of the richest people across the world. Once they have crossed all of these different levels of needs, they start looking for self-actualization. They start uh, contemplating about uh, the meaning of life. They will start thinking about uh, spirituality. They want to do good for others. Some of them may start uh, charitable foundations or uh, some of them may donate their money for uh, philanthropic causes because here they have satisfied all of their previous or lower level needs and they do not need to prove anything to anyone. They are looking for self-fulfillment, spiritual attainment and self-satisfaction. This is Maslow's need hierarchy theory and this is something that we can see in reality in the people around us. How does Maslow's need hierarchy theory of motivation work in an organizational context? Since uh, the basic reason why a person would want to work in an organization is uh, salary or uh, compensation, the salary or the monetary rewards are the basic needs. Irrespective of what else the organization may offer, if the person is not being fairly paid, then a candidate may not join. And even if a candidate joins, after realizing that he or she is not being paid a fair salary, the person will most likely leave. Once the basic salary needs of the employee are satisfied, then the person will look for long-term safety and security like job security, pension or retirement benefits and even workplace safety. Once uh, these two levels of needs are satisfied, then the employee will look for affiliation or belongingness, such as uh, cordial relationships with colleagues, 
pride in the corporate brand like uh, people proudly say that uh, they work for a google or an apple the next level are esteem needs where employees look for promotions higher job titles higher responsibilities and more power in the organization and uh, typically most employees reach this stage and they stay there till they resign or retire only a few employees may look for self actualization in an organization but uh, i have come across a few people who have reached this stage they are not interested in a promotion or a change because they enjoy the work that they do and the work gives them personal satisfaction and the goals that they have at this stage are those which are set by themselves understanding this concept of uh, maslow's need hierarchy helps the management in understanding at what level a specific employee is at currently and what will motivate the employee further to summarize the concept of uh, maslow's need hierarchy theory of motivation in an organizational context maslow's theory focuses on the needs of a person as the basis for motivation and uh, this theory is based on the following assumptions people's behavior is based on their needs satisfaction of such needs influences their behavior people's needs are in a hierarchical order starting from basic needs to other higher level needs a satisfied need can no longer motivate a person only the next higher level need can motivate him or her and a person moves to the next higher level of uh, the hierarchy only when the lower level need is satisfied next let us look at financial and non financial incentives to motivate employees we know that uh, employees are motivated by different types of needs and organizations offer incentives which are intended to fulfill these different types of needs and motivate the employees these uh, incentives can be financial or non financial financial incentives are in monetary form that is either money or any other perks or benefits measurable in monetary terms that is a value in terms of money can be assigned to such incentives non financial incentives are those which focus on psychological social and emotional needs some common types of financial incentives can be pay and allowances such as the basic salary including allowances and may also include some performance based increments productivity linked wage incentives such as when wages are linked to increased productivity at individual or increased productivity at group levels or team levels bonus which is additional payment over and above the basic wages or salary profit sharing such as providing employees with a share of the organization's profits to motivate their performance stock options which is offering company shares at a lower price or as rewards creating a sense of ownership among the employees retirement benefits which offer financial security through provident fund pension and gratuity after retirement and perquisites which are additional benefits like car allowance housing medical aid etc which are offered beyond that is over and above the normal salary next let us look at non financial incentives which are not in monetary form and which cannot exactly be valued in terms of money examples of uh, common non financial incentives are status which is uh, a higher designation or a higher rank that satisfies psychological and social needs through authority recognition and prestige good organizational climate which includes autonomy reward orientation and risk taking that encourage proactive employees career advancement such as uh, opportunities for skill development and promotion motivating employees to perform better job enrichment which is done by designing jobs with uh, more variety more autonomy and more responsibility to make the work itself motivating employee recognition programs which means acknowledging and appreciating the employees work such as uh, congratulating them or displaying their achievements or giving them awards job security by providing stability in future income and work by visibly prioritizing employees over short term profits employee participation which is uh, involving employees in uh, decision making through committees or other participatory methods and uh, employee empowerment which means giving employees more autonomy and power making them feel that their jobs are important which in turn enhances job performance 
Leadership is the third element of directing. There are several definitions of leadership that are mentioned in the textbook. Leadership is the activity of influencing people to strive willingly for group objectives. Leadership is the art or process of influencing people so that they will strive willingly and enthusiastically towards the achievement of group goals. Leadership is a set of interpersonal behaviors designed to influence employees to cooperate in the achievement of objectives. These three definitions are somewhat similar in nature. The most interesting definition says that leadership is both a process and a property. The process of leadership is the use of non-coercive influence to direct and coordinate the activities of the members of an organized group towards the accomplishment of group objectives. As a property, leadership is a set of qualities or characteristics attributed to those who are perceived to successfully employ such influence. So the first part of this definition says that leadership is a process of influencing people to willingly work towards the organization's objectives without coercing them or forcing them. The second part says that any person who can influence people to work willingly is a leader and has the properties of leadership. Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose was a great leader and uh, in his example we can see why leadership is both a process and a property. He did not coerce or force people to join the Indian National Army and risk their lives. But uh, he was able to influence people to willingly join the INA and fight against the British rule. This is an example of the process of leadership. He was able to influence people because he had the properties or the characteristics required to be a leader. Next, let us look at the features of leadership and leader-follower relationship. The first key feature of leadership is influence because leadership involves the ability of an individual to influence others. Next is a behavioral change because leadership aims to bring about changes in the behavior of others. Then uh, interpersonal relations because leadership is characterized by the relationship between the leaders and the followers. Leadership is uh, goal oriented because leadership is exercised to achieve the common goals of the organization. And uh, leadership is a continuous process because leadership is an ongoing and continuous process that is required as long as the organization is operating. Moving on to leader-follower relationship, a leader is someone who possesses the attributes of leadership, which is obvious. The success of leadership depends not only on the leader, but also on the followers, which means that a person can try to be a leader, but unless others are willing to accept the person as their leader, the person will not succeed. While the leader contributes through his or her leadership and the ability to motivate the followers, the followers contribute through their skills, knowledge, commitment, willingness to cooperate and team spirit. A good leader is uh, often made effective by the acceptance and support of their followers. This is the same as the second point. And uh, obviously, both leaders and followers play crucial roles in the leadership process. A leader cannot be a leader without the followers and the followers need a leader to follow. What is the importance of leadership in an organization? Leadership is a crucial factor in determining the success or the failure of an organization. Effective leadership is vital for achieving lasting organizational success. Therefore, leadership plays a crucial role in the success of an organization. A leader not only commits their followers to organizational goals, but also effectively pools resources, guides and motivates subordinates to achieve these goals. Therefore, leadership plays an important part in the commitment of workers to achieving the goals of the organization. What are the benefits of leadership? Leadership positively influences the behavior of people, motivating them to contribute their energies towards the organization's benefit and consistently achieve positive results. Therefore, leadership is required to influence the behavior of the employees. Leaders maintain personal relationships with followers, fulfilling their needs by providing confidence, support and encouragement, which fosters or builds a positive work environment. Leaders play a pivotal role in introducing necessary changes within the organization. 
they persuade clarify and inspire people to accept changes minimizing resistance and discontentment which means that leaders are required to facilitate changes in the organization effective leaders handle conflicts skillfully allowing followers to express their feelings and disagreements while resolving issues through persuasion and clarification thereby preventing adverse effects so a benefit of leadership is conflict management leaders provide training to their subordinates build up successors and ensure a smooth succession planning a point to remember here is that no leader is perfect not all good leaders possess every quality of effective leadership therefore understanding these qualities helps managers acquire them through training and conscious effort which means that some qualities of leadership may be natural other qualities can be acquired through training development and practice next let us look at leadership styles there are different styles of leadership and they can be classified on the basis of the use of authority that is how the leader uses his or her leadership authority leadership can be classified into one of the three basic styles there are autocratic or authoritarian leaders there are democratic or participative leaders and there are laissez faire or free reign leaders let us look at each of these styles in a little detail an autocratic or authoritarian leader gives orders and expects the subordinates to obey the orders without questioning communication is one way from the leader to the subordinates which means that the leader does not actively seek inputs from the followers the leader is resistant to change or contradiction which means that the leader may believe that he or she is perfectly correct the leader uses reward and punishment or fear to ensure compliance people follow orders mostly because they are afraid or because they do not have an option not to follow this type of leadership is effective in situations which require a lot of discipline this is suitable in situations requiring quick decision making and high levels of productivity where uh, the main requirement is for the workers to follow the given instructions exactly such as uh, in a factory setting and uh, this style of leadership is also used in the armed forces like uh, the army the navy or the air force where orders are given and uh, they are expected to be followed democratic or participative leaders involve the subordinates in the decision making and the action planning process the leader encourages participation and values the opinions of the others in the team this style of leadership believes that people perform best when they set their own objectives democratic or participatory leadership fosters a supportive environment the subordinates are motivated to achieve organizational objectives on their own because they want to and not because they are afraid this style of leadership uses the collective strength of the group to exercise control because uh, remember the decisions and the plans were made with the inputs of the entire group so the entire group will ensure that the plans are followed laissez faire is a french word it is pronounced as laissez faire and this is also called free rein leadership a rein is a rope that is used to control animals like uh, horses which restricts the independence of the animals free rein essentially means no restrictions in the context of uh, leadership free rein means a high degree of independence a laissez faire or a free rein leader uses power minimally and allows the followers a high degree of independence subordinates are responsible for setting their own objectives and resolving issues the leader provides support and uh, the necessary information but does not interfere in the normal work process this style of leadership is suitable for groups that are self motivated and capable of working independently who do not need active supervision the subordinates are mature enough to assume full responsibility for their own work to summarize these three styles of leadership autocratic leaders exercise maximum authority and the leader takes all the decisions without any input from the team members democratic leaders exercise a medium level of authority and uh, while the decisions are still taken by the leader he or she will include the team members in the decision making process by asking for their inputs and uh, laissez faire leaders exercise a minimum authority 
and allow the team members the maximum level of independence allowing them to set their own goals or take their own decisions independently typically in an organization you can see authoritarian leadership may be used by the operational managers who give orders and expect the workers to follow the orders the middle level managers typically use democratic leadership and the top management uses laissez faire leadership because the top management is dealing with very mature individuals who are capable of taking their own decisions and they will take ownership of their own work coming to flexibility in leadership styles leaders may or rather must adopt a combination of these three styles depending on the situation even uh, laissez faire leaders may impose certain rules and uh, even democratic leaders may take independent decisions like uh, autocratic leaders in emergency situations this uh, flexibility ensures that the leadership style of the managers is adapted to the needs of the situation and the needs of the team what are the advantages and the disadvantages of the three different leadership styles with the autocratic or authoritarian leadership there is quick decision making because the leader does not wait for anyone's opinions or feedback there is a clear direction and expectations because employees are just expected to do what the leader wants because of the quick decisions this leadership style works well in crisis situations or in high pressure situations and a strong and authoritarian leader may actually reduce stress by providing strong guidance like uh, a strong army leader can reduce the stress of the soldiers and command them to just follow the orders but uh, there are also some disadvantages with the authoritarian style of leadership it can lead to low morale and uh, low job satisfaction because people may eventually get frustrated with this style of leadership it uh, limits creativity because here only the leader is thinking and everyone else is just following orders and there is no input from the rest of the team there is a risk of over dependency on the leader because after a while nobody in the team is capable of taking any decisions the team members are so used to just following the leaders that they feel lost if the leader is not available and the fact that the leader is giving orders and uh, everyone just has to follow them without questioning may eventually create a hostile work environment democratic or uh, participative leadership encourages creativity and innovation because the opinions and the inputs of all the team members are taken into consideration this type of leadership builds team commitment and employee morale this style fosters better decision making with diverse input because different opinions and viewpoints are taken into consideration and the leader can make use of multiple sources of information by encouraging all the team members to be part of the decision making process the leader enhances team collaboration and participation but uh, this democratic style may lead to slower decision making process because the leader has to wait for the opinions and the inputs of all the team members to be collected this style can also lead to conflicts or indecision due to differences in opinions one employee says do this and another employee says do that and this can lead to conflicts and indecision this style may also cause frustration due to delayed decisions which also means that this leadership style is not effective in situations which require quick decisions for example when an army group is under attack from the enemy the leader has to take quick decisions the leader cannot call all the soldiers and ask for their opinions and feedback on what to do when they are already under attack laissez faire or free reign leadership encourages independence and creativity because all employees have the freedom to take their own decisions and express themselves this leadership style may lead to high job satisfaction especially for self motivated employees because the team members are not dependent on their leaders to take decisions and they are allowed to use their own ideas this leadership style allows for rapid innovation and flexibility in the way that the team members do their work and uh, employees may appreciate the minimal interference in their work as long as uh, they are completing their work there is no unnecessary pressure on them but uh, this style can lead to a lack of direction or guidance especially with new or inexperienced employees 
if employees are not sure of something and uh, the leader is not giving them clear instructions then they may get confused this may lead to low productivity if the team members lack uh, self motivation and the leader is not driving them the fact that the team members can take their own decisions can result in unclear roles and unclear responsibilities and uh, the fact that the leader is not interfering in their uh, day to day work may cause the leadership to seem disengaged or absent employees may feel that their leader is not working at all so every leadership style has its own advantages and disadvantages and an ideal leader may have to adopt one of these three different styles depending on the specific situation and the specific type of employees that he or she has to manage communication is the fourth element of direction the word communication is derived from the latin word communis meaning common which implies creating common understanding communication is the process of exchanging ideas views facts feelings etc between or among people to achieve mutual understanding as per various management experts communication involves the exchange of information between two or more persons with a goal of reaching a shared understanding The textbook includes some definitions of communication. Communication is the sum of all things one person does when he wants to create understanding in the mind of another. It involves systematic and continuous process of telling, listening and understanding. When uh, two people are talking, the first person will tell something, the second person will listen and uh, the second person will understand it. Then the second person will tell the first person will listen and the first person will understand in this way communication is a cycle communication is a transfer of information from the sender to the receiver with the information being understood by the receiver here again there is a importance being given to the concept of understanding because just telling and listening is not enough whatever is being told should be understood by the listener for communication to happen For example if a Chinese person speaks to me in Chinese I will listen to what he is saying but I may not understand anything so communication is not happening communication is a process by which people create and share information with one another in order to reach common understanding here again it is apparent that the intention of the person sharing any information is that the audience or the other persons should understand what the speaker is trying to convey why is communication important in directing or in management communication is the key to success effective communication is crucial for a manager's success without it professional knowledge and intelligence become less impactful the manager may know a lot of things but if he or she is not able to communicate effectively with the workers or with the teams then the manager will not be successful communication has a major influence on directing abilities because a manager's ability to direct or to guide or to motivate subordinates relies heavily on their communication skills making it essential for organizational success and also the manager's success organizations prioritize improving communication skills for both managers and employees recognizing its importance in fostering understanding and collaboration This is the reason why most organizations conduct uh, trainings and workshops for developing effective communication skills among all employees. What are the elements of communication? Communication is a process that involves uh, several key elements, each playing a crucial role in ensuring the message is effectively conveyed and understood. The first element is the sender, the person who initiates the communication. the sender may want to convey some information some ideas or feelings and this is the message the sender will then encode the information or the idea or the feelings into a language or it may be in the form of a picture or it may be a sound or it may be as simple as an emoji then the encoded message is transmitted through a media the media may be a phone whatsapp radio tv newspaper etc depending on the type of message and who is the intended receiver the receiver will hear read or see the media and decode it after decoding the message can be understood by the receiver then there may also be feedback through which the receiver conveys back 
to the sender that he or she has understood the communication. It may be an acknowledgement or a thumbs up emoji or even a simple nod. In all of this, there is also noise. Noise is anything that prevents or disrupts effective communication. The noise may be with the sender itself because he or she is not clear about what he or she wants to convey in the first place. Or the noise may be in the message because the message is not clear or it is ambiguous. For example, if I tell somebody on the phone, come here, then the message is ambiguous because where is here? And there is also an assumption that the receiver knows where I want him or her to come. This ambiguity or assumption may be noise. The noise may be in the encoding. For example, if I use a language that is not understood by the receiver, then whatever I am trying to say will just be noise to the listener. The noise may be in the media, such as a bad connection, or in some cases, the media may distort the message that I am trying to send in some way. The noise may be with the decoding, where the receiver has misinterpreted what I am trying to convey. Or after decoding, the noise may be again in the message, because it may turn out to be ambiguous or confusing. Or the noise may be in the receiver himself or herself, because the receiver may not want to believe me. So there is a mental block, which is also noise. Or it can be as simple as the receiver not having spectacles and therefore cannot clearly read what I am trying to convey. So the noise may also be in the feedback, which leads the sender to believe that the receiver has understood the communication, whereas in reality, the receiver has misunderstood. All the reasons which negatively affect the understanding in a communication process are called noise. These are the points about uh, the elements of communication that I have explained. You can pause the video here and note down these points. Sender is the person who initiates the communication. Sender is the source of the communication. Message is the content that the sender wants to communicate, such as uh, ideas, feelings, suggestions, orders, etc. Encoding is the process of converting the message into symbols, such as words, pictures, gestures, etc. The media or the channel is the medium or the path through which the encoded message is transmitted. This can include written forms, face-to-face -face communication, phone calls, internet, etc. Decoding is the process by which the receiver interprets or converts the encoded symbols back into meaningful ideas or information. Receiver is the person or the entity that receives the communication from the sender. Feedback is the response or the actions of the receiver that indicate whether they have received and understood the sender's message. Noise is any obstruction or hindrance that distorts or disrupts the communication process. Examples of noise include ambiguous or faulty encoding, such as using a language that is not understood by the receiver. Problems with the medium used, such as a bad signal in a mobile connection. Inattentive receivers, such as the students being distracted in the classroom and not paying attention to the teacher. Faulty decoding, such as misunderstanding the message and incorrect translation. And prejudices or assumptions that obstruct proper understanding of the message. What is the importance of communication in an organization? Communication is the basis of coordination. Communication is essential for coordinating activities, departments and individuals within an organization. It ensures that the organizational goals, processes and instructions are understood by everyone involved. Communication is required for the smooth working of an enterprise because communication is vital for the uninterrupted functioning of an organization. It enables managers to coordinate between human and physical resources efficiently. Communication is the basis of decision making because communication provides the necessary information for decision making. Without communication, managers would be unable to make informed and meaningful decisions. Communication increases managerial efficiency because communication is involved in all aspects of the managerial functions, from conveying goals and instructions to overseeing performance. And the communication ensures that the organization functions effectively and efficiently. Communication promotes cooperation and industrial peace because uh, effective two-way communication fosters cooperation and mutual understanding between the management and the workers. 
this leads to industrial peace and it enhances efficiency communication establishes effective leadership communication is the foundation of leadership a leader's ability to influence subordinates relies heavily or strongly on his or her communication skills communication boosts morale and provides motivation a good communication system enables the management to motivate and satisfy the subordinates it helps employees adjust to the physical and social aspects of work and it promotes good human relations so these are the points as to why communication is important in an organization let us now look at the classification of communication communication can be formal or informal formal communication may be vertical or horizontal and formal vertical communication may happen upward or downward formal communication occurs through official channels as outlined in the organizational chart which tells us who is reporting to whom and who is responsible for various things in the organization communication can take place between different levels of hierarchy that is vertically or across the same level that is horizontally in formal vertical communication there can be upward communication which is the flow of information from the subordinates to the superiors such as applications for leave submission of progress reports request for grants etc or it may be vertical downward communication which is the flow of information from the superiors to the subordinates such as notices for meetings orders to complete specific tasks or passing guidelines or instructions horizontal lateral communication occurs between employees or managers at the same level across different departments for example communication between a production manager and a marketing manager regarding a product delivery schedule or design or quality is horizontal lateral communication informal communication is also called grapevine communication why if you look at a wild grapevine it will grow and spread randomly in different directions there is no specific structure and this is similar to how informal communication happens in an organization it will be unstructured and random and will grow in different directions but uh, when the same grape vines are grown in a vineyard and there are specific frames and supports then they grow in a structured and orderly fashion just like how formal communication happens in an organization in a structured and a orderly fashion informal communication occurs outside the formal communication channels this type of communication spreads throughout an organization without adhering to official lines of authority for example a junior member of one team may informally communicate with a senior member of another team without keeping his or her own manager in the loop so what are the characteristics of informal communication it can be spontaneous and unstructured because it arises from the natural need of employees to share views and information that may not be easily communicated through formal channels for example casual conversations among employees about uh, workplace rumors or about behavior of superiors or about potential transfers it can be rapid and uncontrolled because information spreads quickly through the grapevine networks often without regard for accuracy which can lead to distortions and can create rumors it can be difficult to trace the origin of informal communication is hard to identify making it challenging to manage employees may just say i heard it from someone without identifying who gave them the informal or incorrect information it may have an impact on the work environment because rumors and informal discussions can influence employee behavior sometimes negatively affecting the work environment but uh, these informal communication networks also have some potential benefits because despite its risks informal communication can be useful for managers to quickly disseminate information or gauge employee reactions before making any formal announcements or communications for example if the company wants to change a particular process or policy the informal networks can help the managers in understanding how the workers may react and they can make any required changes before they formally roll out or announce the policies next let us look at different types of communication networks we have already discussed that there are two types of communications which can happen in an organization 
formal and informal. There are different types of networks under these two types of communication. A network is just a path or a route through which the information flows within the organization. Network refers to the pattern or the structure of information flow between different individuals or different groups. There are five main types of formal communication networks, single chain, wheel, circular, free flow and inverted V. There are four main types of informal communication networks, single strand, gossip, probability and cluster chain. We will discuss each of these patterns in a little detail. In a single chain network, communication flows in a linear sequence from one level of the hierarchy to the next, that is from superior or supervisor to the subordinate. In a wheel network, all communication flows through a central figure, the superior, who acts as a hub. The subordinates do not communicate directly with each other because all communication has to flow through the superior. In a circular network, communication moves in a circular manner where each person can only communicate with their immediate neighbors in either direction. This leads to slower communication flow because information may have to pass through several people before reaching an intended recipient. In a free flow network, everyone is free to communicate with anyone else in the network. This type of network facilitates the fastest communication because there is a direct path for information from one employee to the other. In an inverted V, a subordinate can communicate with both their immediate superior and also their superior superior. In many companies, this is also referred to as skip level communication because the information or the communication can skip one level in the organizational hierarchy. However, communication with the higher superior is typically restricted to specific prescribed matters. For example, if uh, an employee's concerns are not being addressed by the immediate manager or the immediate manager himself or herself is the problem, then the employee can go to the next level. In an informal or grey point single strand network, communication flows sequentially from one person to the next. In a gossip network, each person communicates with everyone else on a non-selective basis. If there is an opportunity, the information or the gossip is passed on. In a probability network, communication occurs randomly between individuals with no specific pattern. It is called a probability network because at every step, the information may or may not flow to all the connections. There is a probability that some people may receive the information and there is a probability that some people may not receive it because they are not connected to the grapevine or the informal network. In a cluster network, communication happens selectively, where an individual shares information only with trusted people. This is the most common informal network in organizations. Even though all the persons in the cluster network are directly or indirectly connected with each other, some of them may still not receive the information because it is being selectively shared. For example, all the female employees of the organization may be sharing information about the behavior of a particular senior person in the organization. But uh, they may not be comfortable in sharing the information with their male colleagues. So the information is being shared selectively. Next, let us talk about the barriers to communication. When I previously explained about uh, the concept of noise in the elements of communication, I mentioned that noise can distort or disrupt effective communication. And there is an overlap between the concept of noise and the concept of barriers to communication. This overlap is because noise is also a barrier to communication. So communication barriers are obstacles that impede the effective exchange of information. They can distort, block or alter the intended message leading to misunderstandings, misinterpretation or a breakdown in communication. They can occur at any stage of the communication process and can be caused by various factors. The barriers to communication can be classified under four main categories, semantic, psychological, organizational and personal barriers. Semantic barriers to communication arise from issues in encoding and decoding messages, often due to language, interpretation or translation problems. Some examples of semantic barriers 
are badly expressed messages where poor vocabulary or uh, wrong word usage or omission of necessary words can lead to unclear messages symbols with uh, different meanings for example words with the same or similar spellings but with different meanings or multiple meanings can cause confusion if the intended meaning or the context of the word is not clear faulty translations where uh, errors in translating messages from one language to another can lead to miscommunication unclarified assumptions which means that assumptions in communication that are not clearly explained can lead to different interpretations technical jargon where uh, specialized language or uh, short forms or code words or jargon may not be understood by those outside the field and this can cause confusion for example if i use the abbreviation afaik in a message some people may know that it means as far as i know and other people may not realize what it means and uh, finally body language and uh, gesture decoding can also be a barrier for example in some cultures people may shake their head for saying yes which can be interpreted as saying no by a person from another culture so incongruent or uh, unfamiliar body language and gestures can mislead the receiver about the sender's true message psychological barriers to communication refers to the emotional and psychological states which can interfere with effective communication for example many times even before you can complete what you are saying the other person may say yeah i know i know and may try to respond back to you this is premature evaluation which is judging a message before it is fully communicated and this can lead to misunderstandings lack of attention which is simple because a preoccupied mind can prevent the receiver from fully understanding the message loss of transmission and poor retention especially if any information is being verbally transmitted from one person to another it may get distorted some important parts may get lost some random parts may get added and finally it may become something else completely different from the original message so as messages pass through various levels information can be lost or distorted especially in oral communication and uh, finally distrust lack of trust between the sender and the receiver can hinder the accurate interpretation of the messages the receiver may get the information but may choose not to believe it so the information becomes useless organizational barriers to communication are related to the organizational structure and processes they can be intentional or unintentional they are related to how the organization has been designed or how it functions for example organizational policy some organizations have policies that don't support open communication and can restrict the flow of information sometimes the policies may be valid such as to prevent the flow of confidential information and in some cases there may be no practical reasons for the restrictions next is rules and regulations rigid procedures and prescribed channels can delay communication this is quite common in many large organizations where any communications to a larger audience has to be approved by the senior management and the communication team or the legal team these rules and regulations may cause delays in communication status where differences in status or differences in the hierarchy can cause a psychological distance preventing open communication between superiors and subordinates a manager may not communicate freely with the juniors and the juniors may be hesitant in communicating with the seniors complexity in organizational structure where multiple managerial levels or multiple levels of hierarchy can delay and distort communication due to the increased filtering points because the communication has to flow through the proper path across multiple people and uh, finally organizational facilities where the lack of communication facilities or forums or modes like uh, meetings suggestion boxes or social gatherings can hinder effective communication so these are organizational barriers to communication personal barriers to communication arise from the personal attitudes and characteristics of the individuals involved in the communication which can be the sender the receiver or any other persons through whom the information is being transmitted for example fear of challenge to authority where superiors may withhold communication or information if they perceive it as a threat 
to their authority lack of confidence in subordinates superiors who lack confidence in their subordinates may not seek their opinions or advice and may withhold information unwillingness to communicate for example subordinates may avoid communication with their seniors or managers if they fear that it will negatively impact their interest or negatively affect their career for example in many companies employees may be very afraid in complaining about any issues caused by their managers because they may be afraid that they will be targeted by the management and uh, lack of proper incentives without incentives or recognition subordinates may not be motivated to communicate effectively in some organizations employees may feel that they should just do their own work and go home even if they have some information that can benefit the organization or help others they may choose to keep quiet because they don't have any real incentive to speak up the final topic in this chapter is about improving communication effectiveness these are all very simple points that you can jot down and use in your answers these are the ways in which the managers or the leaders in an organization can make communication more effective the first point is clarify the ideas before communication which is to ensure that the message is clear and well understood by the sender before conveying it to the subordinates or the receivers which is common sense communicate according to the needs of the receiver which is to tailor the communication to the receiver's level of understanding and adjusting the message according to their education and comprehension levels consult others before communicating which is to involve others in the communication planning process to gain acceptance and cooperation from subordinates be aware of the language tone and the content because the language the tone and content of the message should be appropriate clear non offensive and stimulating to the audience convey things of help and value to the listeners focus on the interests and the needs of the audience making the message relevant to their concerns to evoke a positive response ensure proper feedback encourage feedback from the receiver to confirm that the message has been understood for example the only way in which i get to know if you have understood this topic is when you post your comments or feedback below this video communicate for present and future wherever possible address both current needs and future goals in the communication to maintain consistency and long term focus follow up communications that is regularly follow up on instructions to ensure implementation and resolve any obstacles and finally and uh, probably the most important point is to be a good listener practice active patient and attentive listening to solve problems and to show interest in the subordinates inputs and uh, with that we have completed this chapter if you have any questions or feedback post a comment below I will see you again very soon in the next video where we will cover the next chapter take care and jai hind